Well, good morning. I suppose I should thank Derek for making me feel special or old. I feel more old, but I am a lot younger than you, my friend, so <laughs> I don't feel that old. Um, okay, I'm just going to jump right into this. Oh, I just turned this off. Good start. <laughs> um, so during COVID, I'm sure like most of you, unless I'm the only unspiritual one, I watched a lot of Netflix. Do we have any Netflix watchers during COVID? Seriously, nobody? Like, okay, you're all lying, okay? Who actually watched Netflix or TV or whatever during COVID? Okay, thank you, hello. I watched a lot of Netflix, because there's nothing else to do. And Derek and I got really intrigued by this one show that we're still watching now. And every once in a while, the kids would sit on an, in on an episode. And of course, each episode is good in and of itself. But how many of you know when you've watched a show from like the beginning, like you're invested, like you know these characters, you want to know what's going on, like it's so much better when you know the backstory, right? You with me? So this morning, I thought, we're talking about times of refreshing, and I'm going to read you a verse that pretty much everybody knows, okay? It's a good episode of the Bible on its own. But we're going to give you, like, as much context as we can because it's so much better when you're invested, when you know what's happening beforehand. Make sense? Okay, so I'm going to throw in a little joke here, and I don't know that any of you will get it, but this is the title of my sermon, Times of Refreshing, Episode 3, The One Where We Renew Our Strength. Oh, we've got a lot of Friends fans here. Okay, okay, good. I wasn't sure. Okay, let's read this together. Isaiah 40, verses 31. I'm out of breath already. I'm 40! <laughs> Okay, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Now, how many of you have never heard that verse before in your life? This is brand new information, right? No, this is on t-shirts. This is on your grandmother's cross stitch on the wall. This is everywhere. This is on your screensavers. We've got pictures of eagles with this. We've got paintings. Because it's a good episode, isn't it? It's so true. And it's an amazing promise. And I really don't even need to explain this at all. And we would, could just remember that and go home. Right? Yeah. True. I'm being serious. True. It's a good episode. But in studying this week, I... I uh, I, I've watched the backstory. God's kind of taking me through the backstory of this more than I could share. I was like looking at history and stuff. I'm not a history buff at all, but I am a researcher. So I just love stuff like that. I'm looking at the history and I'm like, this is so boring. I can't share this at all. But to me, it's super cool knowing what's going on in this verse. But I'm not going to take you through all that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to like... Like, if my kids were watching an episode, they'd be like, so what happened since we last watched? And I'd be like, oh, pause. Okay, so, so-and-so went here, you know, and you give the backstory really fast, right? That's what I'm going to do, okay? To get the most out of this, though, do the research. It's amazing, okay? But I'm going to catch you up as fast as I can. Okay, so just taking the context of the chapter alone, forget the biblical history and everything, which is fascinating, just the chapter itself is going to put some things in perspective. So, recapping, verse 1 to 2, actually, let me just give you this caveat. If you read through the verses and you hear my summary, you're not automatically going to reach that leap, you know what I mean? It's like when you do the research and the context and the history and the blah, 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 blah. This is the major paraphrase that's happening, okay? Can you guys trust me with that? Okay. So verse 1 and 2 basically says, Take comfort. Jesus has paid the price for your sins. 3 to 5. Prepare the way because what you think has been your defeat, I'm going to make my victory. These are good verses. And we're only at verse 5. 5. Verse 6 is to 8. All the threats that are here today will be gone tomorrow. The only thing that lasts is what I say. 
my word matters. My word stays the same. So verse 9, set your eyes on me. Look to me. Because in verse 10, I'm coming. I'm coming in power, and I'm coming with my reward. And when he's talking about this, he's talking to three different situations with the same verse. He's saying, I'm coming to rescue you from exile, which is speaking to their current situation. He was saying, I'm coming to to rescue you from sin, which is referring to Jesus and the gospel message. He's saying, I'm coming to you to rescue from this life in the second coming. I'm coming. Set your eyes on me. I'm coming. And I am able to take care of your every need. And then verse 12, he sees that the people in this situation would be easily overwhelmed by their situation. How many of you are overwhelmed by some of the situations that you're in? Okay, again, y'all lie all the time. How many of you are overwhelmed by some of the situations you're in? Like COVID, and then we don't need to go any further, and we're all overwhelmed, right? Like it's just such a pain, and we're overwhelmed. And he sees people overwhelmed by the situations that they're in, the immensity of the issues that they're dealing with, and he starts doing some interesting comparisons. Verse 12, he points to the size of the ocean, the immensity of the ocean, the depth of the ocean, the weight of the earth, the breadth of the universe, and he says, you see how big and deep and wide and heavy and immense those things? Do you think you can't even understand how big the universe is? Like, we try and grasp that, and our brain just like, not functioning, error, error, error. Like you can't, you think you know, because you're like, yeah, the stars, you know, I see the stars. And they shine and they twinkle and it's pretty and we sing the little song. But then when you really try and grasp how far away that is, like I don't know about you, but I just can't, I can't. It's just like, nope, like syntax error on your calculator. Like, nope, that doesn't function. That, that doesn't calculate. And he compares to those things. And he says, you see all those things and how big and strong and powerful they are? Yeah, I'm so much bigger. I'm so much bigger. And then verse 13 and 14, he points to his omnipotence. omniscience. He says, my, my intelligence, my understanding, my wisdom is so far above yours that you don't even understand how far above yours it even is. It's not like, here's what I understand, here's what you understand, and you can understand how much more I understand. Your understanding is so limited, you can't even comprehend what you don't understand. And that's how much bigger I am than you. It just doesn't compute. Like your little kindergarten kid, when they come home from kindergarten, my uh, nephew comes home from kindergarten his first day. He goes, Mom, I have learned all I need to know for life. And she goes, really? What's that? And he goes, I know my alphabet, and I can count to 10. What more do I need? <laughs> and it, like, he didn't even understand what he doesn't understand, you know? The, the gap between where he needs to go and where he is. He didn't even understand that. That's kind of where we're at when compared to God. We don't even understand how much more he understands. He's so much smarter. I'm so much bigger, he says. I'm so much smarter. Verse 15 to 18, he points to the most powerful leaders and nation in the world at that time, which at this particular time, there would have been a lot of powerful leaders and a lot of powerful nations, and they're all rising up, and they're all fighting each other, and they're all trying to make deals with one another to overthrow that guy. No way we want to do that guy. It was like a fight for power. So when he's pointing to... Look at these powerful leaders and nations in the world. He's pointing to their next door neighbors that one day, one day this guy is threatening to take over the world and then this guy's taking over, this is the guy's taking over and actually he made a deal with that guy and actually we're going to take over now. We have power now. They have power. There's threats, 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 power, power, power everywhere. War, war, war everywhere. And God points to them and he says, you see all those powerful leaders and nations in the world? Put them all together. I dare you to put them all in one big package and this is how much bigger I am than them. You put them all on a scale and they're like dust on a scale they don't even register like I look on the scale and I kind of hope that there's like 100 pounds of dust on there you know what I mean like I want the dust to register but it it doesn't it's all me (laughs) this is kind of what God is saying it's like I am so much more powerful than them that if you add all of their power up 
and put it on a scale, it doesn't even make it move at all. I am so much more powerful. Verse 19 to 20, he points to the gods of those nations whom some of the Israelites were tempted to serve and were serving because they thought, hey, if, if they're having success in war and financially and they're gaining different training route, trading routes and, and we used to have that, but then they overtook us and now they control that trading route and they're getting a lot of money, that maybe these gods that they serve, maybe they, there's something to them and I should serve them too. God points to them and says, seriously? <laughs> seriously, they, they take some gold, they hire somebody to make a figure out of it, and they worship it. And then if you can't afford gold, they just bring a piece of wood and do the same for themselves. And he points to them, he goes, they're, they're, I'm not just a god above those gods. They're not even gods at all. I am the true God, the one God, the one that actually has power and strength. Verses 21 to 26 recap all of this information all over again. But instead of taking 20 verses, they take five. He says basically the universe is tiny. The rulers of, the, the rulers of this world, they're nothing. The threats of today, gone tomorrow. I am incomparably bigger, stronger, wiser, more powerful than anything you see around you. And then we come to where we're going to actually read, Isaiah 40, verses 27 to 31. And just before I read it, I want you to listen to the recap again. So he took 20 verses to say how amazing he is, and then he took five verses to remind us of how amazing he is, and now he's taking three verses to remind us of the reminder of how amazing he is. Okay? I want you to see that when we read this. Uh, New Living Translation. How can you say, there we go, how can we say that the Lord does not see your troubles? Have you not heard? Have you not understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of of all the earth. So we've already done, remember, we've already done 20 verses of this, and then another five, and then he's like, do you not know who I am still? After everything that you've seen, after everything you remember, after everything you know about me, do you still not know who I am? Just in case you forget, I'll tell you again. And then I will say, he, God, never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He is the one who gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. For even youths become weak and tired, and young men fall in exhaustion, but those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. That is the context of that verse. I'm going to Chandra paraphrase, okay? Don't ever quote Chandra paraphrases. It's not a good idea. But just to help you remember, verses 1 to 20. I, the Lord, am the best thing ever. 21 to 25. See? 27 to 28. See? 31, so you can trust me. And actually, if you look at the scriptures and the whole context of it, first Isaiah 42, 49, it just goes on and on and on about, like, it doesn't stop at the end of the chapter. We as humans have put these little markers in there to help us memorize things, but it keeps going. And basically, if you keep reading it, it's like, I'm awesome, I'm awesome, I'm awesome. Jesus is coming. The end timings, the end times are coming. I'm awesome. I'm awesome. I promise. I promise. I'm awesome. I'm awesome. I promise. I promise. I'm awesome. I'm awesome. It's like somehow between the pages, we've forgotten the very first verse. That like Jesus is coming. He's paid our sins. He loves us. He's stronger than anything we will ever face. And he says it over and over and over and over again. 
So as I narrow into what this verse means, to wait upon the Lord, I don't want you to get the wrong idea that waiting upon the Lord is the focus of this chapter. It's the cart, okay? Horse goes before the cart. If we try and put the cart before the horse, it doesn't work very well. The driving force behind why we can trust God is because God is freaking awesome. He is. And we forget. So he reminds us over and over and over and over again. Thank God. So as I'm focusing and narrowing in on the cart, I'm not saying the cart goes before the horse, okay? The reason why we trust God, the reason why I'm going to encourage you to trust him further is because he is trustworthy. And all of the source of help that you need to trust God, all of the power that you need to trust God, everything that you need to do to walk this life comes from him. It is not of our own strength. We don't manipulate God. It's not a formula. It's not do these five things and your life will work out. Please, please, please hear me. God is awesome. 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 You have no idea actually how awesome I really am. So you can trust me. Okay? But I am going to spend a few minutes right here on the you can trust me part. To wait for the Lord. King James, as we read earlier, says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And somehow it's prettier. Okay? I just, I don't know why that sounds prettier when we talk like that. But, like, I didn't even read King James when I was a kid, and yet the one that I remember, this verse, when I quote this verse in my head, is, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So somehow King James just got stuck in my head. And so I'm going to use that language because that's what I learned. The word that's used for to wait, or in this other translation they use trust in, means to look for expectantly. To look for expectantly going to give you a little Bible study hint. If you're looking at a verse and you come across a word and it's kind of in a weird context and you're like, That's, that doesn't really totally make sense to me, one of the easiest ways that you can figure out what it may, means is look up where that particular book uses that word in, so for example, we're in Isaiah. Where does that word show up in Isaiah? What other context does, is it used in? And that often gives you help kind of placing, like, what does it mean? Do I mean, like, literally waiting on God? Like, like where are you? I'm here. Like, does, is that what it's talking about? And in this, in this um, one, one of the places that it's used in, in Isaiah, I'm tripping all over my words because it's, like, so much harder with this. Just pray for me, okay? Um, is when... Isaiah is referring to someone who is looking for grapes on a vine that has been planted. So you've planted a vine, you've nurtured it, and it comes that time where, like, I should be seeing grapes here. So you pull back the leaves, and you're looking expectantly to see a monkey. No. Okay, wow. <laughs> stay with me, stay with me. I know this blocks some of our oxygen, but we've, we've, we can do this. What are we looking for? Grapes. We are looking, expecting grapes. So this to wait word, to look for expectantly, is to look for God expecting to find him. This is good news. There's a difference between waiting, looking for something expectantly versus waiting without expectation. I'll give you a very funny example. Towards the end of my grandmother's life, uh, just right at the end, she started to go a little senile. And just before we could transfer her into a nursing home, my brother went to visit her at her house. And he came in after school or wherever it was. And she was in a bit of a tizzy. I can't find them. I can't find them. I can't find them, she said. I can't find them. So he's like, Grandma, Grandma, can I help you find something? Yes, look in my address book. She, he's like, okay, where, where's your address book? It's on my dresser. So he goes over and he's like, is this off? So I won't. Go. Okay. Where is, where, I'm look. okay, here's your address book. Okay, Grandma, what am I looking for? And he goes, 
She goes, my blueberries, of course. <laughs> and he goes, oh, flip, 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 flip. They're not in here. <laughs> he was not expecting to find blueberries in an address book. So did he really look? No, no, you just flip through it, humor my grandma and put it aside. That's not where you're going to find blueberries. But to look for something expectantly, like maybe the fridge, I left them in the fridge, then you're going to look, you're going to look, you're going to search until you find, because you're expecting to find them. There's something trusting, like, I don't know where you are, God, I can't find you. Are you here? Uh, no, I guess you're nowhere. I guess I'll never find you. Is that looking for expectantly? If somebody said, if, actually this morning, I couldn't find Derek. And they're like, he's out that way. So I went this way. And he wasn't at the check-in. He wasn't in the storage. He wasn't in the hallway. He wasn't in the kids' room. And I'm like, but they just saw him. He's, I'm going to go back. I must have missed him because I just saw him. I'm looking for him expectantly. I know he's there. I just can't see him can't find him would be a difference between I'm looking for Derek and I'm just going to guess he's in the hallway and I look and I'm like no I guess he's not here I'm going to look somewhere else that that would be just like looking versus looking expectantly you follow okay you're with me there's an intensity difference looking expectantly automatically infers there's a wholeheartedness Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. If I just had my keys in my pocket and I get up from the couch and I lost my keys, but I know I just had them in my pocket, then I'm going to start ripping apart that couch. Like the cushions are coming up. I'm going to wholeheartedly look in that couch because they are in that couch. Right? wholeheartedly. They are here somewhere. I just can't see them. Versus, eh, I don't know. They might be here. You look at the couch and you're like, no, not here. There's a wholeheartedness. There's an intensity when you're looking for something expectantly. You'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You know what's super interesting about this verse? Have you ever thought of, why doesn't it say, you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. Because that would make sense, wouldn't it? Am I alone? Wouldn't that verse, if you were writing a letter, wouldn't you say, you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart? But that's not what it says, does it? It says, you'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. What is he saying? That there's something in the seeking, the wholehearted seeking, that invokes more seeking. That if I was wholeheartedly looking for my keys, and I missed them, I would do it again. I would look again. The wholeheartedness invokes like a cycle. You'll seek me and find me when you seek me wholeheartedly. There's a persistency that's insinuated here. Looking expectantly is wholeheartedly looking. Looking expectantly is looking persistently. Matthew 7, 7, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. What's interesting about this verse, if you look in the Greek tenses, it would be better interpreted like it's, it's, it's an ongoing action. It's not referring to a one and done action. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. There's, there's a persistency like just do it again and again and again and again. And it will be given to you and you will find and it will be open to you again and again and again. Looking expectantly is an action word. When we think in the English, like waiting, like we think like just sitting down in the doctor's office, like, like literally putting in time because I can't do anything else. Like just literally nothing. But that's not the word here. This is looking for expectantly. It's 
in the Hebrew, it's, it's in like a, in a, I don't remember the official words for Hebrew because I'm not good at Hebrew at all. But it's in the present and ongoing. So it would be saying like, not those who wait will be renewed, but those who are waiting, those who are currently trusting. Not just, I trusted God once, and he came through for me once. True. But those who are trusting, waiting, will renew their strength. So it's a process. It's an action. Like, currently doing that. I don't know about you, but uh, it's not so bad now that my oldest can drive. But just before he learned how to drive, I mean, my job was chauffeur. Like, I mean, it was ridiculous. I recorded one day because both of them, both of our two oldest kids were in volleyball tournaments that day. And I, I just, out of curiosity, I recorded how long I was in the car driving my kids around that day. It was a Friday. And it was three hours and 45 minutes that I was driving everybody all around the city. Three hours and 45 sen- minutes of my life driving my children. Okay. <laughs> And so when I was in that really busy time, there was many, many times that I'd be coming from one, like dropping them off and picking up the other one and going, and we were already late, you know, like I needed to go. And so I would call ahead and I would say, I'm on my way. I need you to be dressed with your backpack waiting for me. And they're like, okay, mom, I got it. And so I pull up to the house. I'm like, open the door, get out, get your sister. And then I'd sit in the driveway and I'd be like, where are they? I t- oh, I called, and you know, like one minute would pass, and you think, okay, they're just getting their shoes on. That's it. That's just shoes. Just, you know, it's okay. It's okay. And two minutes, like two minutes. What do they have to tie their shoes? Like just bring their shoes. And then three minutes, you're like, oh, okay, did they forget something? Four minutes, you're like, I called. We are now four minutes late. Five minutes, you get out of the car, and you know when Mama gets out of the car after she has already asked you. Like, it's not like, honey, where are you? You're just like, if I have to get out of the car and we're already late, it's like, knock, 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 knock. I asked you to be waiting for me. (laughs) And I'll walk in and I'll find their bag at the door. God bless my children. They have to do what I ask. Bag at the door, their shoes ready to go. Everything's by the door, but they're sitting in the living room watching TV. And then I come in and they're like, oh, you're here. I didn't see you coming. I'm like, you didn't see me coming because you weren't looking because I was there. Yeah, but I thought you'd be longer than that. I don't care if you thought I'd be longer than that. I was asking you to look for me, to wait for me. That was insinuated, like, get your stuff ready. Be ready to go. I'm coming. Wait for me. Okay, so what I was expecting is for my kids to look out the window expecting to see me coming at any moment. But instead what I found is them half ready. Because I, I, well, I didn't really expect for you to be here. There's an active, an activity that's implied in the waiting of looking for expectantly doesn't mean like just sitting like, oh, yeah, I'll do it when you get here. It's like I'm actively looking for you because you could show up at any minute. And I want to be ready. I want to capture that moment. I want to be ready to run. I want my shoes on so my mama doesn't get mad. No, just kidding. <laughs> He's a lot more patient than us, a lot more. There's an active, it's, it's looking expectantly is looking actively. And here's the promise. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. That word renew means to put on afresh. It actually means to keep putting on afresh. It's the same word used for changing your clothes. You exchange the old for the new. This is what renew is. And again, this condition, this aspect, or whatever it is in Hebrew, I'm sorry, I've forgotten, is one that insinuates, I'm just going to read it because it's like super smart sounding. (laughs) 
the kind of unfinished condition of the action which consists in frequent repetition. An unfinished condition of the action consisting in frequent repetition, which means it's not a one-and-done deal. I hear this a lot. I hear it from my own mouth, so I'm not condemning anybody. I did trust God. Yeah, and that's good. But this is not a a one-and-done. I did trust God for strength, and he gave me strength, and then it's gone, and now what? It's like, yeah, well, you do it again. This is not saying when it says you'll soar on wings like eagle, you'll run, you'll walk without weary. It is not saying you will never tire. That's ridiculous. We all know we tire. What it is saying is your source will never dry up, ever. Can you imagine being in Bible times when they're facing war? And as Derek mentioned, water was so valuable. You, drill, you go down and you find water. It's like us finding oil now. Like, yes, I am set for life. I have a source of water. And if you knew somehow that that source of water would never dry up, can you imagine the elation that they would feel? Like, I have a source of water to, to supply me of everything I will ever need. And it will never dry up. So I can go back and draw water. And I can go back and draw water. I can go back and draw water. And it will just be there. Again and again. We'll soar because we have a source that never runs dry. So that when we put on his strength, and then it's like this energizer bunny, and we're going and we're going, and then it's like, ma, ma, ma. Like Sunday afternoons for Derek and I, okay? Pretty much. It's like, that was a great service. (laughs) Okay? Like we've got nothing. And I'm not talking about spirit, I'm not talking about physically either, but there's a spiritual giving. And we feel that on Sunday afternoon. There's many times that tears are shed on Sunday afternoon because I'm like, God, would you fill me again? Would you fill me again? Because I gave something away this morning. And I need you to fill me, to renew my strength on a Sunday afternoon so I can make it through the week, so I can make it this afternoon. I get tired, physically tired, mentally tired, spiritually tired. But we have a source that never tires. But there's something habitual in the process that I... I do this. I learned to do this once. I learned to look to God for strength, and he comes through for me, and that's amazing. And then I have to learn how to do it again because I'm going to need it again. And, and I'll be honest, no matter how much strength God gives me to lead worship or preach or give counseling or do any of the ministry things that he's asking me to do, you know he gives me strength for that which he's asked me to do in that moment, I personally would love him to just say, I'm going to make you so super spiritually strong that I'm just, you're going to, I'm going to fill you once and you're going to be able to do everything. I think that would be awesome. And yet, (laughs) it's not awesome at all. As a matter of fact, it's very, very dangerous. Because if it's somehow I feel like I don't need God to minister, That is a very, very, very dangerous place to be. Very dangerous. And so I thank God that I have strength for Sunday morning, and then I don't. And I'm back to him. I have strength to go make that difficult call at work. Difficult meetings that you face, difficulties with your children, difficulties in life. And you're like, I don't have the strength to do this. I don't have the mindset to do this. I'm not sure how I'm going to make it through 10 years of this. Well, don't think about 10 years of it. What do you need today? Renew your strength today because he will supply your needs today. For some of you, it's by the hour. 
Like after, like, like I think I shared this with some of you, I can't remember, but after our relaunch of, of in this setting, uh, my daughter was really struggling with physics, and she had some sort of test the next day. So that afternoon, we went home. We had company for lunch, and then Derek fell asleep, and I really wanted to go to sleep, and my daughter knocked, 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 knocked. Mom, can you help me with grade 11 projectile motion? I was like, oh, God. You know how far the ball will land. Can you help me show her? Do I believe that God cares about my daughter? Yeah, I do. Do I believe that either he'll give me strength to help her or he'll give her strength to help her? One of the two. There's nothing that's like more or less spiritual to draw upon God for. Everything, anything you look to God for habitually over and over and over again. Okay, so I'm going to sum this up. Can you put on the slide that says, got them listed in a row? Okay, so those who wait for the Lord, wait for him wholeheartedly, expectantly, persistently, actively, habitually. Now, if you went to Preaching 101 in my Bible college, they talked about you know, exegesis and, and how you draw upon the truth and all that kind of stuff. But then there was like the practical section. section. And ba way back when, 20, too many years ago, in Preaching 101, they're like, and if you can get them to have a way of remembering something, that would help. And they gave you all these different ways you could help them remember things. And one of them was giving them like an acronym. Okay, so I don't know about you, but like I tried lots of different things and I'm like, not happening. This is not happening until, and I am not lying. I, uh, we prayed because I was frustrated. I was like, I don't know what the take home of this is. And Derek's like, well, let's just pray that God knows, <laughs> God knows how you should end. And I'm like, okay. So we prayed and it doesn't normally happen like instantaneously, but it did. And I started laughing. I'm like, really, God, you want me to say that? Because, and I'm so glad you got my friends jokes, because that means that there are friends lovers here, okay? So I'm going to explain to the non-friends episode people what I'm talking about. But there is an episode where one of the characters in Friends is trying to make a whip noise, like, Ksh! you know? And instead of making that noise, he goes, a whoop -a! And they make fun of him. And they're like, what is that? And he goes, that's a whip. whoop -a. They're like, no. Ksh, ksh. And they make fun of him. So when I was asking God, how do I get people to remember this? To take this to God, to do their own research, to take it with them, that it wouldn't just be something here and it falls flat and you, as soon as you leave, you forget. <laughs> so yes, I'm going to do this. We are to wait on God. Whoopa! Wholeheartedly, expectantly, persistently, actively, habitually. See, you might not remember what any of those words are, but you're going to remember, I remember, whoopa! And I'll be like, yes, but did you remember the point? <laughs> when talking to God about this, and I'm going to ask the van to come up real quick. There's nothing in this sermon that's really new information. And so when I was asking God, like, why am I sharing basically a, a motivational reminder? And, and like, this is, how, this is how, like, God has to break things down for me. And he's like, to remind them. Like, right. That makes sense. <laughs> right. To remind them. I'm like, okay, so what am I reminding them of? Okay. God is awesome. So much more awesome than we give him credit for. And thus, when I'm encouraging you to seek him out, 
whoopah, Lee. It's not from a religious duty of like, make Chandra happy, and this week, go do these five things. It's not, it's not to appease God. It's none of those reasons. I am asking and reminding you to seek God wholeheartedly and expectantly and persistently and actively and habitually because God is way more amazing than you think he is. And even those who have served him for many, many years need to be reminded, oh yeah, he's much bigger. He's much stronger. He's much wiser. He's much more loving. He's much kinder. He's much more patient. So no matter what level of understanding that you have of God, you have not arrived. This message does not not apply to anyone. We are to seek after him. Who are you, God? Show me who you are because I know I'm grasping like this much. But I want to know you more. I want to know you more. I want to find you. The the promise is you seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Some of us give up because we just haven't found him yet. You're going through really difficult times and you're like, God, I just don't, where are you? I mean, you just don't show up. Don't give up. You'll find him. He's there. He'll find you for crying out loud. He promises, draw near, near to me, I'll draw near to you. He promises, I've been found by those who were not seeking me. What does that mean? I found them. He goes after the 99, finds them. You will find him. You will find him in in another level of understanding. You will receive more of him. Don't give up. Pursue. Press in. Make the effort. It's worth it. It's worth it. So the band is going to sing, and then Derek will close. And they're going to sing, I just want you and nothing else. Because when we press our eyes onto who he is, we realize that everything we will ever need is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So I just want you guys all to stand. We're going to get Jarrett to lead the song. Derek's going to close. I didn't get into the details of how and why you should what that looks like, whether you should join a Bible study, what what your devotional life should look like, all that kind of thing. Because God will help you with that. But if you have questions of like, I'm not really sure where to start, I'm not really sure how to seek God wholeheartedly, I don't know what devotion would be good for me, we are always available. We can point you in the right direction. But I am trusting that as you walk out those doors, as you stand here and worship, that you allow God to lead you where you need to go. What is he asking you to do with this information? Make sense? Make sense. God bless you. Hey, I'm Pastor Derek. And I'm Pastor Shanga. And thank you for joining us here at Advanced Church Online. It's our hope as a church to help you deepen your relationship with Christ and strengthen your faith. And we would love to connect with you. And there's a number of ways that you can do that. You can email us. You can text us. Or you can comment below. And of course, you can always visit our website to get more information about us. Thanks for joining us. See you next week.